I can remember being a kid in 1995 and seeing a trailer on TV for the movie The Indian in the Cupboard. And the trailer had this one sequence in particular where this kid put a heap of action figures into a cupboard, which brings them all to life where we see toys of Darth Vader and Robocop actually come to life. And this immediately made me want to watch this movie. I nagged my parents to take me to the movie theater to see it. And all because of that one split second in the trailer, I was expecting a fun movie about toys coming to life. But when I actually saw the movie, what I actually got was a pretty somber and depressing movie. Not this fun, sort of Toy Story movie with movie characters running around that I was expecting it to be. So, Indian in the Cupboard tells the story of Omri, who for his ninth birthday is gifted with an old cupboard and a plastic figurine of a Native American. And when he locks the figurine in a cupboard with an old family key, the figurine comes to life. Of which, admittedly, most cupboards don't do that. Well, not that I'm aware of anyway. The once plastic toy is Little Bear, who comes from another place and time, where Omri and Little Bear must find common ground and look beyond each other's completely different worlds and build a mutual trust and thus create a powerful bond like no other. Man, I am bored. Well, may as well drink out of my cup. Wait. Cup. Bored. Cup. Board, cup, board, board, cup, cup, board, cupboard. Ten things that you didn't know about Indian in the cupboard. Let's check it out. Number 10, based on a book. Yes, The Indian in the Cupboard is indeed based on the book of the same name, which was published in 1980 and was written by British children's author Lynn Reed Banks. And just like the movie, the gist of the story is about a boy called Omri, who for his ninth birthday is gifted with a cupboard and a small plastic Native American figure, of which he puts the figure in the cupboard and locks it with a key that belonged to his grandmother, which causes the character of Little Bear to come to life, along with any other plastic figures for that matter. Banks originally came up with this strange tale as a bedtime story for her son. There are actually several significant changes between the book and movie. For example, in the movie, the cupboard looks like an old, timey wooden cupboard, which gives it more of an ancient, mystical appearance, whereas in the book, it's described as a white, metal medicine cupboard. In some edits of the book, Little Bear is known as Little Bull. Also in the movie, Omri offers to gift Little Bear with a wife by putting a female plastic figurine into the cupboard. But Little Bear rejects this offer, fearing that she has her own life and he doesn't want to take her away from it. Whereas in the book, it's Little Bear himself who requests a wife and chooses one from a selection of plastic female Native American figures, where we are introduced to the character Bright Stars. The movie is set in America, whereas in the book, it takes place in the UK. Now, the book was met with great praise upon its release, where it won several awards, and New York Times labelled it the best novel of the year in an article called Books Best for Children. Although the book wasn't without its criticisms, particularly in response to the Little Bear character, and depicting what some felt were American Indian savagery stereotypes. Regardless, the book was a huge success, and really, it was only a matter of time till it would be adapted onto the big screen. (sighs) Number 9. Directed by a Muppet The Indian in the Cupboard's movie production was something of an E.T. reunion, as the movie's script was written by Melissa Matheson, who in the previous decade wrote the script for Steven Spielberg's impossibly popular alien friendship movie, E.T. the Extraterrestrial 
and I can see the logic for hiring her to write the screenplay for Indian in the Cupboard, as not only was E.T. insanely successful, but it was also about a young boy who befriends an out-of-this-world, or at least out-of-his-world character, just like Indian in the Cupboard. Matheson also wrote the Kick the Can segment in the Twilight Zone movie, and at the time of writing The Indian in the Cupboard, she was married to Harrison Ford. Yeah. Likewise, The Indian in the Cupboard was produced by Frank Marshall and Kathleen Kennedy. Yes, as in that somewhat divisive modern Star Wars producer. Both of whom had previously also produced the as-mentioned E.T. So it seems the studio involved wanted a movie of E.T. levels of success and proportions. When it came to directing the movie, veteran Muppeteer and Yoda performer Frank Oz was offered the job. Originally, he didn't want to direct, as he didn't really see himself as a children's director, despite previously directing The Muppets Take Manhattan. But, to be fair, he had moved away from children's entertainment, to more adult orientated works, such as The Little Shop of Horrors, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, and What About Bob? But nevertheless, he came on board as director. The Indian in the cupboard also had a heap of companies associated with it including Paramount Pictures, who were distributing the movie's American release, and Columbia TriStar Films, who distributed the movie's international release, as well as the Kennedy Marshall Company, and Scholastic Entertainment, which was a division of the publication company Scholastic, which, incidentally, also around about that time, helped with the development of the Goosebumps TV series. Number 8. The Cast in the Cupboard when it came to the cast of The Indian in the Cupboard, the part of Little Bear was cast with actor and musician Lightfoot. He is also the executive director of the Native American Financial Services Association. Lightfoot came to be starring in the movie after the American Indian College Fund saw him performing a rap number at a concert in Rome, and so after that they recommended him to the movie's production. After Indian in the Cupboard, he played Nightwolf in Mortal Kombat Annihilation. The character of Omri's father, Victor, was played by Richard Jenkins, whom I'll always know from The Witches of Eastwick and Cabin in the Woods. Boone, the cowboy figure who comes to life, was played by David Keefe, who previously played Drew Barrymore's father in Firestarter. The role of Patrick, Omri's mischievous but kind-hearted best friend, was played by Rishi Barr. He actually earned a Young Artist Award nomination for his performance in The Indian in the Cupboard. But after starring in the movie, he never acted again, where in later adult life he would go on to become a successful software entrepreneur. And a young Steve Coogan had a brief role as a World War I medical officer, who, like the other figurines, starts off as a plastic toy, but is then brought into the real world in order to help Boom when he gets injured. And Indian in the Cupboard was his first Hollywood film role, as at that time he mainly starred in British TV comedy shows. Communion actress Lindsay Krauss starred as Omri's mum, Jane. And I always felt she came across as being really warm and kind. She had great chemistry with the child cast. Finally, Omri was played by former child actor Hal Scardino. Wow, that's actually a pretty badass name. He would go on to star alongside Leonardo DiCaprio in a movie called Marvin's Room in 1996. But afterwards, it appears that he gave up on acting. And so all those who grew up watching Indian in the Cupboard, get ready to feel old, as this is what he looks like now. Yeah, whenever I see current photos of what kids who are in movies that I grew up watching look like now, it always makes me feel like that meme of Private Ryan when he suddenly gets really old. <laughs> Number 7. Accident on Set Filming of The Indian in the Cupboard lasted about four months, with it commencing from July 1994 to October 1994. The shoot took place around New York and Los Angeles. The production had a Mohawk advisor on the set to help with the authenticity of the little bear character, but Lightfoot himself recommended Onondaga advisor Gene Shenandoah instead, where every tiny detail of little bear's appearance was authentic. Before Lightfoot would film his scenes, he could spend up to four and a half hours in the makeup chair, having his tattoos drawn onto his body with a permanent marker. Yeah, in the old school days, when it came to characters needing tattoos, it was time to whip out the old handy-dandy marker. 
However, a tragedy would take place on set, which really put a dark cloud over the entire production. When a technician died on set while riding a mechanical hoister, which was used to lift scenery onto sound stages. Without a doubt, it was a tragic turn of events, and no one should ever lose their life for a movie. And this accident would lead to new and updated laws and safety measures in the movie industry. Regardless, it seems the production never fully recovered from this tragic turn of events. Number 6. A Change of Music The score for The Indian in the Cupboard was originally composed by Miles Goodman. And wow, Goodman has scored a lot of movies in his time. At some capacity, he has worked for the music for memorable movies like Being There, Footloose, Teen Wolf, La Bamba, and Problem Child, to name but just a few. He was good friends with Indian in the Cupboard's director Frank Oz, and scored several of Oz's movies, including Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, What About Bob, How Sitter, and Little Shop of Horrors, for which he was nominated for a Golden Globe. However, the score Goodman had created for Indian in the Cupboard was rejected, and thus it wasn't used for the movie. Sadly, he never composed any more movies with Oz again, as he passed away the following year in 1996. Now, parts of Goodman's score are available on YouTube to listen to, and upon listening to it, it sounds more childlike and playful and mischievous, giving it an almost fun Goonies sound. But as for the actual score used, instead the production went with Randy Edelman, who in the late 80s and early 90s composed the music for several fantasy movies, including Ghostbusters 2, Drop Dead Fred, and The Mask. Heck, the same year he composed The Indian in the Cupboard, he also scored Billy Madison, which kind of shows off his range. Stop looking at me, swan! His score for The Indian in the Cupboard sounds more powerful and epic, and it does feel more like it's trying to be a contemporary fairy tale, and it does tap into the more serious themes of the movie. Now, speaking of music, there is a scene in The Indian in the Cupboard where we see the Omri and Patrick characters watching the music video for Motley Crue's song Girls, Girls, Girls. <laughs> yep, the 90s sure didn't muck about. Number 5. The Unused Drew Struzan Poster The movie poster for The Indian in the Cupboard shows a dimly lit visual of Omri holding Little Bear, homing in on the whole toy figurine coming to life aspect. I also think the New York City skyline in the background is a nice touch, as it shows the juxtaposition of the movie's modern world to Little Bear's world. However, movie poster legend Drew Struzan also designed a poster for The Indian in the Cupboard, where we get this illustration. And yeah, it looks very Struzan-esque, with similar illustration styles you would see in his other posters like Hook and Harry Potter. It is essentially the same idea as the final poster, only a more illustrated one. And both posters even have a purple tint. And by the way, they really did Omri actor Hal Scardino wrong in the modern marketing of the movie. As although in the original poster, they have him looking all innocent and angelic. But is it just me? In the modern poster, they've made him look like Carrot Top. Seriously, what's going on? Number 4. What's in the Cupboard? So now we get to the scene that is without a doubt the most famous scene in the movie. The one that I think most kids at the time remember the movie for. The scene where Omri puts well-known action figures into the cupboard and thus bringing them to life. Which, as mentioned, was the reason for me wanting to see the movie in the first place. So let's do a deep dive into what characters are actually in the cupboard. Of course we have Darth Vader and Robocop. In order to use the Darth Vader character, Frank Oz actually had to get permission from Lucasfilm, which he did get. I guess it helps that he played Yoda in the Star Wars movies. We also have the T-Rex from Jurassic Park, a G.I. Joe action figure, and these two Star Trek characters. One being a Cardassian soldier, and the other being a Ferengi. Now I'm not really familiar with these characters, and I'm actually having to look up how to pronounce them. After all, my love of Star Trek doesn't really go beyond the Spock and Kirk days. So I'll just refer to them as a bunch of Star Trek wankers. <laughs> okay, okay, that's just a joke. 
But in all seriousness, this is actually a very important scene in science fiction history, as it's supposedly the only, or at least one of very few times, that Star Trek and Star Wars characters have appeared on film together. So this should be up there with seeing Mickey Mouse and Bugs Bunny on screen together in Who Framed Roger Rabbit. The movie's trailer actually made the scene look a lot better than how it did in the film. In the trailer, we actually see close-ups of Darth Vader and Robocop, but we don't see those close-ups in the actual movie. And we only see the scene from a distance, and the shot is actually really dimly lit. Like, you kind of have to really focus a little bit to see what's going on. Once again, unlike the trailer, which is perfectly well lit and you can see what's going on. So in the movie, the scene doesn't even really stand out. Now, I don't know why this happened. Maybe someone in the production felt that they shouldn't be promoting violent movies like Jurassic Park and Robocop in a movie for small children. But that's just a guess. I feel like the trailer makes the scene look awesome and suggests that this movie is going to be a fun time where some of your favorite action figures come to life and isn't that exciting, yeah! But the actual scene in the actual movie only goes on for mere seconds and the Omri character doesn't even look excited about this but he looks more disturbed and terrified as if to suggest that bringing these characters to life wouldn't actually be fun but would actually be terrifying. But that's not the lesson that I wanted to take away from this when I was 11 years old. I wanted it to be fun and to see Darth Vader and Robocop duke it out. Oh well, at least they didn't use the bootleg Robocop figure, Robert Cop. Half man, half cop, all Robert. There are other figures that also appear in Indian in the Cupboard, including Ram Man from He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, and this guy who I believe was the villain from a 1990s cartoon called Biker Mice from Mars. Number 3. There was sequels. When The Indian in the Cupboard was in production, there was actually plans to make a film series based on the book sequels to the original Indian in the Cupboard book. But due to the not so flattering reception of the movie, the subsequent sequels were scrapped, leaving Indian in the Cupboard as a one and done film. So had it gone to plan, the Indian in the Cupboard film series could have been the Harry Potter series of the 90s. But yeah, there actually exists further sequels in this mythology, including The Return of the Indian in 1985, The Secret of the Indian in 1989, The Mystery of the Cupboard in 1993, and finally The Key to the Indian in 1998. Now, I've got to be honest, I haven't read the sequels, but from what I've read about them is that they further explore the mythology of the cupboard, the key, and Little Bear's world. Where it's explained that people from our world can actually travel to Little Bear's and Boom's world and time zones, but they themselves become miniature, just like the Boom and Little Bear characters do when they travel to this world. And there are other plot points added, like Little Bear's wife, who he gets at the end of the first book, becoming pregnant, and a tornado destroying Omri's home, along with crazy old relatives. Yeah, the story goes off into several different tangents and subplots. And the books even explore Omri's past family heritage, and how the key and the cupboard came to be, and why. Reading about this book series makes me wonder if author Lynn Reed Banks was a fan of the Chronicles of Narnia book series and was trying to sort of make her own similar book series. Either way, sequels do exist. So if you're a fan of the movie and dying to know what happens next, you've got four book sequels awaiting you. Number two, the box office bomb in the cupboard. Although the Indian in the cupboard may have been about plastic toys coming to life, sadly it didn't bring any life to the box office. The movie was released in July 1995 in the States, and in December of that year in the UK, and it only made $35.7 million, not even recouping its $45 million budget. Sadly, it also got very mixed reviews from critics. Although a lot of critics appreciated the movie's themes and messages of trust, cooperation, and working together, there were some critics who felt the movie was just too dreary and downbeat to hold children's attention. Everyone's favorite critic to reference, Roger Ebert, just flat out called Indian in the Cupboard depressing, and of course made E.T. comparisons, concluding that it can't recapture the humor and excitement of E.T. So, what went wrong? 
How did this movie, which had plenty of hearts and a valued identity lesson, get bogged down with uninspired labels like depressing? Well, once again, I wonder if it goes back to the advertising of the movie, which capitalised on the idea of bringing action figures to life, thanks once again to the shot of Darth Vader and Robocop. I myself was expecting a fun and exciting movie about toys coming to life and roaming about the place. But Indian in the Cupboard is totally not that movie. In fact, the movie does the opposite. It flat out says you shouldn't bring your toy action figures to life as they have their own lives and time zones. And bringing them into this world can actually really screw around with them and their lives and completely mess them up. There's even a scene where Omri tries to bring another plastic figurine to life, which causes the figurine to have a heart attack and die, in which Omri feels really guilty, and then goes on to bury the toy. This is actually really horrific. The point is, leave your toys alone. Don't ever try to bring them to life, or you're a murderer. And this wasn't the life lesson that I was hoping or expecting to get. And I think that's one of the reasons I found the movie so depressing. It's as if the trailer was like, Hey kids, watch this movie, and it'll bring some of your favourite characters to life, yeah! But then you actually go and watch the movie, only to be told that you mustn't do that. You'll bring misery and suffering and possible death to said toys. Incidentally, the very same year The Indian in the Cupboard came out, the very first Toy Story movie came out, which actually was the fun romp about toys coming to life that I think everyone had hoped The Indian in the Cupboard would be. And that movie would become a huge hit. So it shows that for that time, audiences wanted a fun adventure, not a downbeat, somber morality tale. But the question is, how does the Indian in the cupboard hold up with the passing of time? Number 1. Legacy Well, the movie's popularity seems to have increased with the passing of time. In fact, the Indian in the cupboard currently has a 71% score on Rotten Tomatoes. Funny enough, this episode was made because the other week I put up a post on the Minty Comedic Arts Facebook page talking about this movie and the iconic scene where all the movie toys come to life. And I posted it thinking that no one else would probably remember this movie, but, well, I was wrong. The post was inundated with comments by people declaring their love for the movie, and with lots of people saying they grew up with it, and that it's a treasured part of their childhoods. Another theme I noticed in the post was people who also said that they preferred the book, and that they felt the book was so much better. And from what I also took from the comments was that the Indian in the Cupboard book seemed to be taught in schools in the US as part of the fifth grade curriculum. Now, I didn't know that. At my school, we had to read some book which I found really boring at the time called Change the Locks. Not saying it is boring, but I just found it boring at the time. And Bridge to Terabithia, in which that old school book cover terrified me. Look at that, it looks like a horror story. To conclude, I think that although The Indian in the Cupboard is not to everyone's taste, it does have powerful themes, ones that I think resonate more in current times than they did in 1995. Themes of letting go of stereotypes and perceptions, and learning to understand each other's differences, and through that, finding respect and common ground. But it's not told in an angry, aggressive, resentful, hostile way, like modern films with such themes tend to do nowadays. So the movie may not have been the fun romp that I and many others like me at the time thought that it was going to be, but it's still a movie with a good heart. One that definitely gets better with age. So I think the Indian in the cupboard is worth a gander. Just don't expect a rollicking romp, but more of an emotional slow burner. Anyway, I'm Minty, and I hope there is never any Minty figurines because I don't want to disappear and randomly end up in some weird cupboard. See ya!